And it seems that we're live again. Welcome to another edition of Dojo Live, weekly talks with experts like you. Today we have a special guest right from the coast of sunny Florida. And uh, his name is Mr. Alex Rodriguez. He is creative director at Yummy Marketing. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, something that you, a lot of the companies, modern companies, should definitely think about, which is creative strategy and why it's essential for business today. So thank you, Alex, for being here with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm honored and I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. We're honored as, as well. And also, I want to thank my fellow Nearsoftian and co-worker, uh, Fausto Guerrero, uh, he is part of the marketing team, and he's going to be co-hosting us with us, and he's going to be also sharing his uh, his side of the equation, his view on on uh, on creative strategy, and I'm sure that Fausto has a lot of interesting questions that we're going to be talking about and elaborating on. Uh, thank you, Fausto, for agreeing to be part of this today. Hey, th thanks to you. Okay, absolutely, my pleasure. All righty. Well, mm, we're. Um, Alex, first of all, this is kind of like the uh, uh, um, a question that I always ask my speakers, the, speak the speakers that we invite to Dojo Live, is this. Sometimes you choose a specific topic, which is what you did today, creative, creative strategy. Why is it essential for business today? Would you mind telling us, to begin with, why did you choose this particular topic? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. The fact of the matter is that as I was walking into an entrepreneurial role, uh, role in my profession, I have 20 years of industry experience, but uh, only three years as an entrepreneur. So three years ago, we founded Yummy Marketing and walked out into, in some way, a very crowded space. There are a lot of people in uh, a lot of companies, a lot of professionals in this space. Uh, so, but I believe in the power of differentiation. I believe that if you step forth with a differentiating factor and something that is authentic to yourself, you stand a better chance at standing out, at differentiating yourself, no matter if your industry is very crowded or not. So I thought long and hard and looked at my past experience and looked at the steps and the evolution that I had throughout my career and looked for that differentiating factor, the differentiating message that would actually um, add value to the conversation but also uh, put me as the person that would be worthwhile to listen to with regard to this subject. And out of everything that I uh, looked at, at the different, uh, uh, you know, a lot of professionals, they uh, differentiate or attempt to differentiate themselves by a certain specialty or certain expertise in one area or another. So what I looked at it was in myself, what, what do I stand for? What do I believe in? And I realized that as my career evolved throughout the years, there were two things that were a characteristic of, of issues that I dealt with and ways to solve those issues. And it came down to the the recognition that I am able to think in strategic terms and in creative terms as well. So to respond to your question, this is something that is very near and dear to my heart and is something that I believe that I stand for in my message. I try that every piece of content that I put out, every um, effort that I put out, any campaign that I do out embodies these aspects. Um, so, so that's that's why I felt that it was a good topic to discuss today. Absolutely, and indeed it is. Um, okay, if I may, I'd like to start off with uh, uh, with my my first question, which would be, what is the what do you think that the foundation of a really impacting creative strategy should be? The foundation. Well, here's here's the the idea. Let's. I would propose let's start by defining what we mean by creative strategy. If you're if you're okay with that. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And then let's walk into you know the basis of this and where we can take that as business owners, professionals, entrepreneurs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So at at the found, at, at the basis of the notion of creative strategy, what is creative strategy? 
Uh, the idea here is that there are certain tasks, there are certain initiatives, and there are certain mindsets that are more on the side of creative, um, uh, creative personalities, let's say. Um, then there are others that are more on a strategic side. Now, as we moved on, and, and we had a prior conversation before hitting the broadcast button, and I heard some ideas within your profiles in the way you guys defined yourselves, and I'm talking to Fausto and Carlos, right? So we are accustomed to define ourselves as professionals, as individuals, either on a creative side or on a strategic slash analytical side. That's a something that's been drilled down in the modern era, and we've been accustomed to ask ourselves, which of these two sides do we fit in? Uh, and we basically say, I will be more effective if I just stay on this side of the river. Right. Um, we've gone so far as to say, well, there are certain, you know, based on the, the two hemispheres of the brain, there are two types of people. There are left brain people and there are right brain people. And assumedly, the right brain people are those who handle creative tasks a bit more efficiently. And then the left brain people are those who handle analytical sides, uh, analytical tasks more effectively. That would be Fausto of me. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, the fact of the matter is that if you look at actual, you know, current science, these notions have actually put, been put into question. And, and I'm talking specifically not about the, you know, the brain hemisphere or how the brain functions, but rather the idea that you are a left brain person or a right brain person. What actually happens is that we are more experienced or more, uh, we've, we have more exercise, so to speak, trying to have to use a, a muscle analogy. We've exercised the muscle, the creative muscle, a bit more, or we've exercised the analytical muscle a bit more. So when we say, well, like let's say, as an analogy, let's say if I exercise my right hand, I only lift weights with my right hand, what's going to happen is my bicep is going to grow, I'm going to have more strength, but my left hand is going to atrophy, right? Because it's not, I'm not giving it the same amount of exercise as my right hand. And in fitness, to continue the analogy, usually what you want to do is exercise both sides of the body in equal manner, right? But as human beings, what we've done is that we've exercised because we define ourselves, I'm a creative person, therefore I'm going to only exercise the creative side of my being. We've let our strategic side or our analytical side atrophy a little bit. Uh, this is what we tend to do at least. And, and therefore, we become half of our potential capacity. We cut our, our potential capacity in half. Now, that doesn't mean that you, from your experience, your DNA or something like that, um, however we want to define it, uh, that you're not more capable in one area or another. What it does mean is that we usually don't give ourselves a fair chance, a fair shot at balancing those two types of mindset. So by creative strategy, we mean that state of Zen, of uh, yin yang, to continue using dojo terms. I'm a big Japanese fan, by the way. I, I lived in Japan a little bit. I studied Japanese for three years. So I love the, the, the term dojo. It means a lot to me. But, uh, <laughs> but, to uh, <laughs> but if we find, if we recognize that we are limiting our own potential as professionals, as people in the workplace, by saying, this, I'm only going to segment myself and work within a creative mindset or an analytical mindset, if we recognize that we're doing that and we expand ourselves, we open the possibility of being in a balanced state. And the balanced state is, the, let's say the first stage to get there, is to be able to jump from creative tasks and analytical tasks and feel comfortable about them. But then the second stage, which I think is the most powerful one, is when we reach that full bliss, the full state of balance, where we're actually engaging both mindsets at the very same time. So when we do that, and again, it doesn't mean that you're an expert in ana analytics, and it doesn't mean that you're a creative, you know, a creative artist or anything like that. What it means is that you're comfortable thinking in both creative and strategic terms when you're developing communication, when you're developing campaigns, when you're developing internal products. You're keeping those two things in mind and analyzing one topic from both mindsets. I got a question for you here, uh, Alex, if you don't mind. 
Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I totally agree with this because uh, for the audience, before the dojo started, we introduced ourselves and I'm the Jean, Carlos is the Jank or whatever. I'm the analytical side, Carlos works on the creative side. Uh, I agree on this, but basically it's how do you force yourself to enter into the other dimension that you might not like? I mean, I agree, because I'm on the analytical side because I see the opportunities, I see that there's lack of that in Latin America, there, there's a huge opportunity to bring numbers, hard data, and the analytical part that we don't have. So since I see that gap, I really enter into that market to call away or subsector. Mm -hmm. But how do I force myself to get into the creativity mode or side? I love the question, and there are two parts to that question. Number one, the fact that we are uncomfortable with whatever is the side that we're let less uh, exercised at. So just con to continue the the uh, exercise analogy. If I were to exercise my right hand, and and I always make reference to this movie, uh, Lady in the Water. Do you remember that movie? There was th this movie in Lady in the Water. One of the characters is actually that's one of his characteristics. He he exercises his bicep a uh, hundred times, a thousand times a day, only on the right sa right hand. And he has this huge muscle on, on the right hand, but then his left arm is like skinny and laggy and things like that. And I love using this, um, if you want to look that up, at least look up on Google Images, Lady in the Water, Bicep Dude, or something like that, and you'll find a little picture of it. It's quite funny. But the idea here is that if I were to do that, and then I pick up a weight with the side that I exercise the most, what is it gonna, what's going to happen? It's going to feel uncomfortable to me, right? It's going to feel like you know, wow, I don't have the same strength that I have hit this side. So the fact that it is uncomfortable is actually a positive thing. In fact, one of the things that I tend to do as a professional is I look for things that are out of my comfort zone. Because when you're looking at growing, uh, the, uh, the assumption is that you only seek growth in the unexplored areas. If you stay within what's comfortable to you, there is no growth happening, right? So now that you have this framework of looking at the other side of the river, so to speak, now you can see that you can actually um, seek those tax, tasks and, uh, and learning opportunities that feel initially uncomfortable to you, but understand that this is just a natural portion, uh, a natural part of that process of exercising and reaching that balance. The other side to your question, Fausto, is how do you develop that? So once you overcome that initial uh, that initial lack of comfort, recognizing that it's just a fact that you have not had that experience or exercise in that area, once you are able to overcome that, then you're able to seek specific exercise tasks that are in that uncomfortable area. So for example, if I, for example, I, I'll put it this way, I, my background as a professional was 100% in the creative realm. So I started as a full-time musician before I was even in advertising. Full-time musician, um, I was an artist. I went to school for advertising, which in the first two years of advertising program is all about art and drawing and painting and things like that. I went to School of Visual Arts in New York City. So my background is very much in the creative side, full on. I'm a, I'm a song composer and, and things like that. Um, so how, did, how was I comfortable with analytics? Well, one of the things that actually helped me is that two of my brothers are engineers. My father was an electronic technician as well. So I already always surrounded myself with, uh, with people, just at, that in the nature of my family makeup, with people that thought differently than I. So this is the number one thing. Surround yourself with people that don't speak your language. Because again, if you only surround yourself with the people that are, like say if I'm a creative, I only surround myself by creatives, that's not going to help stretch myself, right? So it, it, I, I need to, to surround myself with those peers that actually um, are empathic to where I'm coming from, but at the same time um, are giving me a something challenging to do, right? Something challenging to think about. Uh, look at the sources that they're consuming. What are they consuming? You know, what are the articles that they find relevant? What are the uh, podcasts that they listen to? And expose yourself to those things. Um, ultimately, I think that um, we also learn, if you're anything like me, I learn by not just theoretical or input or just uh, uh, inputting content in my, in my head. I also learn by doing. So what are those specific tasks that you can engage in that will give you that sense of exercise? So if it's an analytical task, 
get right into a spreadsheet, you know, start working with uh, logics and operators and things like that. That's one thing I've, I've done. I've discovered the power of spreadsheets very recently in my life, I have to say, um, uh, shamefully, right? Because I'm, I'm now loving it. I'm loving the, the, the compounding effect of using logic and operators and things like that to, uh, to reach a, you know, a positive outcome. But if you're coming from the analytical strat strategic side, uh, jump over to the creative side. So let's say one thing you can do is start drawing. A lot of people limit themselves and say, you know what, I can't draw well. Well, the fact of the matter is that many, many, many people, the majority of people that draw do not draw well. They're, you're never going to see their pieces in a museum or in an art exhibit, right? I like to speak of the example of uh, Martin Scorsese. If you go and look at, the, let's say, uh, at, at his storyboards, the storyboards that he drew for the movie Taxi Driver, you will think that it was a kindergartner who, wrote the, uh, who, who drew these things. It looks horrendous. Yet this is one of our world's, our time's top cinematographers. And he is able to visualize his shots through the most disgustingly looking drawings, right? But he did not limit himself by saying, I'm not, I'm not good at this. He went through and he said, these drawings represent my vision. So what are those things that you can do from either creative side or an analytical side that will help you engage in that other side of the river? Awesome. Thank you. Very nice explanation. Carlos? I believe you're muted, Carlos. Yeah, that happens a lot. It's uh, I just start mumbling, and I, suddenly I realize that I'm on mute. Um, Alex, tell me something. Uh, <clears throat> as I was listening to you, uh, I couldn't help but uh, noticing this. You were mentioning that even if, for example, as, as, as is my case, I'm not an, a numbers person, I'm not an analytical guy, or I don't work with my left hemisphere, so to speak. Mm, but still, well, this is what I understood. You're encouraging encouraging people like me to try to do some kind of effort to to get um, familiar or to get acquainted, or tr just try to do something that it's not we're not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, you said uh, use a spreadsheet or getting to something that requires analysis, those types of things. But my question would be. Doesn't that get in the way of living by that particular idea of do what you love? Uh, for example, we even had some T-shirts and um, hoodies made, and on the back it read, um, uh, "Life is short, uh, not too short not to do what you love." So, you know, things like that. So, doesn't that get in the way of not doing what you really love? And uh, how do you overcome that feeling of? I am wasting my time because I'm doing things that I don't like. Uh, uh, and how does that apply to the creative strategy of a, of a whole company? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a it's a great point that you raise, and it's worth clarifying that I am not in any way saying that if I'm coming from a creative background, I'm going to completely abandon all my creative tasks and my creative way, my creative strengths to balance out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying these are, uh, what we're trying to do is seek utter balance in, the, in them. And in order to seek balance, that means not abandoning anything. So for example, uh, like I said, I come from a creative background. I've tried to strengthen my analytical strategic side of thinking. But um, last night I was up till two in the morning playing piano with a friend of mine who was at home and he's a great guitarist and bass player and things like that. So we find opportunities to, uh, to engage in what we love. But again, what I'm, not, what I'm also saying is don't limit yourself to what you love because more than likely what you love is what is comfortable to you. If indeed you receive this message that I'm espousing, and you, you think that for your professional development, um, seeking this balance is actually going to be beneficial to you, I believe that it's completely possible for you to seek complete, you know, utter balance to continue strengthening whichever side you believe you belong to, but also stretch yourself and develop your, yourself as a, as a professional to that other area that, um, so, so that you can reach that 
sense of being able to think and critique and analyze in both respects. Uh, now, the last part of your question, I think, is how do we apply that to a, a company makeup? So, um, I, in, in, um, I want to say that it is n logical within a corporate structure to place your employees in kind of more on an analytical side or in a creative side. This is completely natural. And um, as business owners, we do want to empower, we do want to develop our employees, and we want them to be productive in what they do best, right? So this is this is completely acceptable. Um, I, I'm, I'm not saying either that we suddenly strip everybody off of what they do best and just have everybody in the state of balance. But I think that if you are, let's say in your corporation, if you Stre help stretch uh, your employees to develop in this manner so that they start thinking in a more balanced way, what you're going to end up with is not necessarily double the workforce, but I believe double the potential in your workforce to take on different tasks and to collaborate in a more effective manner. Many times it, within an enterprise, uh, is some of those employees that are identified as more analytical are not even allowed to give their opinion or to collaborate on creative matters and vice versa. And then what happens is that there is a sort of a silo in that environment, right? There's sort of a silo because, and this is part of the benefit of this state of balance, is that creative tasks should be, in the best of cases, informed by analysis. And analysis, in order to develop itself and to communicate it, should be informed by creative aspects as well. So the fact of the matter is that when we stretch our workforce in this regard, we're going to end up with, uh, with better creative, creative that is informed by analysis, and, we're going to, and our analysis is also going to be wrapped around what makes us live live, what makes us live as human beings, what, what makes us passionate, which is that creative end, what, what attracts us, what wakes us up in the morning, uh, um, it's going to be kind of energized by those things, and I think it's just going to make an enterprise much, much better. I know, I know. You were going to say, you're on mute. <laughs> it happened to me again. OK, thank you, Alex. Uh, I was a little bit per perplexed because uh, so uh, your response was very enlightening to me, to the tool. So I, I now get it a little bit better. Um, I'd like to pause for, um, for a few seconds to encourage the audience to send us their questions. You remember you, remember you can do so by clicking on the uh, send us your questions uh, prompt right there on the be part of the conversation which is right there on the, on the player if you're watching us from uh, either our YouTube channel or our website, it's right there. Just click on be part of the conversation and it'll tell you what to do. It's very straightforward, no need to do anything special. So, uh, okay, I do have a, a few other questions while we await for the, the audiences, but uh, Fausto, do you have anything else, uh, any other questions for, uh, for Alex before we continue? Oh, sure. Um, just to give us an example, you told us uh, that you like you like to seek those tasks that put you out of the comfort zone. You had mentioned that you had come from the music business or task into analytics. You have visited Japan and stayed there for three years. What is the most challenging thing that you have tried in order to get out of your comfort zone? That's an interesting thought. Um, I think that uh, the most, wow, I'm not sure I can identify one thing in particular. Um, I might want to go back to the, what I mentioned about the people that you surround yourself with. So uh, I am, again, I am not a, a programmer nor a developer. But I understand, uh, you know, a bit. What I understand about developers is because I have inserted myself within communities that speak that language. And some of them might be listening live right now because I sent them an invitation to the show before we started. There is a, a particular community that I engage with uh, through BBSs. I don't know if you remember the era of the BBS. So uh, bulletin board system back then, you know. Um, and we're still live today. Now we communicate through other channels. But the majority of that community 
are people that are driven by analysis, there are programmers, they are uh, developers and things like that. So as a creative person, um, sometimes it becomes, or it has become in the past, a bit uncomfortable because they speak about a term or they speak about a language, uh, uh, you know, programming language and things like that, that I, there comes a point where I, from my background, I may not be able to follow, right? And when you're talking to people that you know, like, and trust, they're close friends, they are uh, uh, unconditional friends and, and, and companions of life, but you can't understand the language that they're speaking, there's a huge tension going on because you want to follow them. They're empathic to you, you're empathic to them, you want to know what drives them, but, uh, but at the same time, you recognize that you have to sort of run a little bit faster to catch up to them, right? So I think that on an ongoing basis, that's one thing that I can identify that um, has put me out of my comfort zone. But, um, but again, I love it. I enjoy being out of the comfort. It's, it's weird because it sounds like, it sounds a bit contradictory, right? Usually you say, well, you either enjoy it or it's uncomfortable to you. But the uncomfortable tasks can also be enjoyable, um, maybe not superficially, but the fact that you are moving towards a development of your career, a development of your person, can become a source of joy for you. So, so uh, once, when, again, once, once I've gotten over that, uh, I've learned to be more patient with myself, and I've developed. You know, I've, I've understood that uh, most human beings in a social setting are empathic to people that speak, you know, differently, that come from a different mindset from where they are. So, if there's something that I don't understand, uh, they know I'm always um, open to uh, ask, and they're all be always open to responding to my question or clarifying questions and things like that. Uh, but uh, but at the end of the day, I think this is uh, something that I would recommend people do. Seek those social circles. Right now, we have you know we have uh, Google Plus communities, we have Slack channels, we have all these things that you can engage in a community. Facebook groups is another one. Engage in a community on a in a kind of a um, in a um, a uh, forum style a tool, right? Uh, engage in a community in which you are able to come at it at the community with your background, but at the same time uh, learn and be stretched by what others contribute to you. Awesome. You really put me for, uh, backwards when I was living in San Carlos, a small American community full of retired people, and I was the youngest there. So when I move into near stuff, I'm one of the oldest ones. So I was like, and it's only, <laughs> it's only developers, QAs, and, and I mean, I'm totally out of my regular comfort zone, you know? <laughs> so yeah. I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I can relate to that. And Fausto, don't start with the age thing, OK? <laughs> I'm gonna, please. <laughs> well, I'm not the oldest. Carlos is. Sorry. <laughs> I'm the, actually, I'm the second oldest of the company. The second one, and not, not the so. Matt is the oldest. OK. Uh, let, uh, Alex, if you don't mind, <clears throat> I'd like to go back a little and go back to the original title, the original um, name of this talk today, which is Creative Strategy. Why is it, why it is essential for business today? Would you mind, on that part, on the why, why is it essential for business today? Can you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Absolutely, yes. And the majority of my, talk, of my talk so far, I know we focus a lot on personal and professional development, right? Because this is at the nucleus of a corporation, right? It's what, what is a corporation made of rather than people, you know, other than people? That's what we, we are at the end of the day. But when we apply it to business, um, we realize that at the core of our business is communication, right? Without communication, there would be no business. We need to communicate with others, people that we do business in, with uh, people that are within our corporate uh, environment, um, et cetera, et cetera, our peers, uh, our competitors or industry colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. So at the core of any business, there is a strong communication factor. And creative strategy becomes a, an essential in communication in, uh, in, those, in two respects. Number one, strategic thinking is all about defining objectives and about defining methods to reach those objectives. 
So in order to have effective communication, there has to be a goal with that com piece of communication. And again, this is not just outbound marketing or uh, customer acquisition. We're talking about everything. We're talking about your internal communication. We're talking about your internal meetings. We're talking about the emails that you send. We're talking about the chat functions that you, you do within your corporation. With any piece of communication, there's always a strategic end. And the strategic end is, number one, like I mentioned, what is the objective with this piece of communication? And number two, what is the most effective way to reach this objective? And this is all about strategic thinking in itself. And, and uh, it's quite ironic that even people that come at it from the creative end, we engage strategically in the way we communicate when we're talking on a normal basis, right? So when it, let's say, for example, when I'm speaking to you right now, I'm not using double the amount of words that I need to. I'm using precisely the amount of words that I need to convey my message. So therefore, I'm being very strategic in my selection of words. Uh, the same as you, as you were promoting this show, you were strategic in the way you spoke about the subject matter of the show, the, the way you spoke about uh, where to access the show, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there's a strategic end to our communication. And then on the other side, there is a creative end to our communication. Why? Because, again, we as, as human beings, we are capable of being motivated. We're capable of being energized. We are capable of being, um, being attracted towards a piece of communication. And that only happens when we think creatively about it. Now, you, can, you, very, if, like you, you guys who, or you, uh, Fausto, who are coming at it from an analytical side, you may not realize this every day. You may not realize this at all moments. But, uh, but even when you submit a report to a client, and I would challenge you to think about this. Let's say you're submitting a market research report. If that report looks very convoluted, it looks full of numbers, it's difficult to take in, it's, uh, let's say it's typeset in a different manner on each page. Let's say the margins are out of balance. There's just something aesthetically with that report that looks off from a creative side. Now, the analysis in this report can be top-notch. It can be perfect in all respects, but yet the creative end is failing in conveying an attractive and, and positive message because aesthetically it just didn't go through. Whereas if you submit a, an aesthetically pleasing report, again, we're talking about the same exact data, but the aesthetically pleasing re report is going to reach a higher percentage of people engaging with that report and being willing to, um, let's say, whether it's a good news or a bad news in that report, or let's say you're just stating the fact, people are going to reach, uh, are going to be much more willing to engage in that report because it's aesthetically pleasing. So from the and and the and again, the creative end is not only limited to visuals, but I'm I'm just using visual um, aesthetics as an analogy for creative excellence. Uh, one of the things I mention in my book is that. It, we have reached a point in our history in that the utmost excellent examples of creativity are accessible to us right from our smartphones without even getting out of bed. So before I get out of bed, before I look at the world, I can switch on my smartphone like many of us do, and I can observe the most highest expressions of human creativity throughout history. So therefore, it's not like back in the, uh, in the 15th century where if you wanted to see something creatively excellent, you had to be, be, be a part of a very privileged uh, community, right? Or you had to have economic status, et cetera, et cetera. Now everybody that is connected to the internet has access to the utmost, um, in, the most incredible examples of creativity. Therefore, we, whether we recognize it or not, we are able to compare any type of creative output with the utmost excellent um, expressions of human creativity. And that goes all the way to the example that I gave of an analytics report to a client, right? So when your client receives that analytics report, unconsciously, they will compare the aesthetics of that report against good design, balanced design, typesetting, et cetera, et cetera. And unconsciously, they'll judge the quality of that report based on the aesthetics. So 
creative and strategy for these these two reasons are essential for business because uh, if we disregard creative strategy as a balanced approach, we run the risk of our communication being affected and not realizing its own potential. Yes, to add there, uh, we also have the biggest, largest amount of information data better than ever in history. So it is as well, the analytical side, it is, and it has to be improved you know, on a daily basis, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Good. There you have it, Fausto. Thank you again, uh, Alex, Fausto, for the question. Um, again, I'd like to remind the audience to send us your questions. Just, you know how to do it. Just go there, be part of the conversation, click it, and you'll be all set. We read them off to Alex, and he'll uh, respond right here. Absolutely. Alex, uh, yes, okay. <clears throat> While we wait for some uh, questions from the audience, there's something else here that I, that I wanted to, to ask you is, is there, I'm trying to word my thoughts here because it's not really something that, uh, that, that I'm trying to land the concept of what I'm thinking. Is there like a roadmap to a creative strategy, to an effective creative strategy, like a basic roadmap to follow that can uh, that be applied to any kind of company or does um, each company individually, depending on the, its very nature, its very segment of our industry, does it need a specific roadmap for each and uh, for each of these companies? That's a great question, and uh, I'll have to insert within my response that I'm actually rewriting a book that I already I didn't publish it. You know, traditionally this book it was just an ebook that I shared online. It's no longer available. But I'm out, I'm I'm uh, about to publish it again this year in an expanded form. And in that book, I I uh, intend to answer that question uh, in a much more objective uh, manner. So I'm still in development mode. So my response is going to be a little bit a little bit loosey goosey. But once the the book comes out, it'll be my formal official response to the question. But what I would say so far is that number one, you need to analyze where you are as a company, where as a business. What where, what state are you in? I've worked in companies, like I said, I've been more on the creative side, so I've worked with companies that are a little bit more equipped on the creative end, and um, and I, I noticed, you know, in the past, and this was something unfortunate, that they purposefully shied away from anything that was too analytical, right? So uh, I think that once you recognize this, and if you do recognize that this is a goal that you want to make as a co corporate mission um, or as a as a per as a professional development mission for your enterprise then I would say the roadmap starts at analyzing where are you where are your strengths and are you missing out on those opportunities to think on a different on the on the, the opposite end of this spectrum that we're drawing out today for your audience um, and then if you are, I guess the next step would be to seek those development opportunities. Um, uh, w developments so, such as uh, what are those hangouts, people that you can hang out with. Um, can you bring a speaker into your enterprise that speaks on that different end to give kind of a friendly, soft introduction to that other end. So let's say, for example, if your enterprise is all about uh, software development and you're more on the analytical side, then bring in a, a creative, bring in, in uh, a right, bring in a person that understands artistic ends to talk to your team and talk about how to infuse creativity in their daily tasks. And I'm sure that your team will have a field day at asking very valid questions that are coming from their perspective on how they can do that. Again, only if they're open to, to keep this as a goal for them. That would be one idea. Um, another idea, again, is to empower your workforce with uh, material, with content that will help them stretch a little bit and, and let them understand that goal uh, and in the end of, of being a bit more balanced in their approach. Thank you so much again, Alex. Mm, Alex, I'd like to... Uh, um we're we're starting to approach the final segment, final uh, the the fourth quarter of the session, and 
before we get into anything else and maybe other questions or something, I, I would particularly, and I think probably Fausto might agree, is can you tell us a little bit, a little bit more about what's behind the digital bacon? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think you have a book, right? Yes. Um, I don't, I don't know if we you probably got it, you got it? can you show it yeah. to the audience. So my book is Digital Bacon, and okay. it's also been published in Spanish. Bacon Digital. That's the the Hispanic sister of my book. Okay. So uh, <laughs> if you guys want to screen cap this, you can do that now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, you can find the English version at digitalbaconbook.com and the Spanish edition at baconDigital. Net, dot net. So the idea behind B Digital Bacon, and it's kind of a nice segue from the topic that we've been talking about, is after analyzing hundreds of successful digital campaigns, what I've done is I've discovered this acronym that spells the five qualities of a, an irresistibly attractive online presence. And these five qualities are in the acronym BACON, B-A-C-O-N. So the first quality is based on reality, based on reality. Successful campaigns are not based on wishes or whims, but actually on research fact about a market, the offer, about the competitive landscape, and about what their target audience is all about. So that's, that's based on reality. The second quality is with A, is aimed towards results, aimed towards results. And this is, in fact, the strategic end of things. So once you understand, the re you've done your research and understand what is the reality of what you're trying to do, you're able to draw out a strategic approach to reach the business goal that you have, the marketing goal that you have. So aimed towards results. Then the C stands for creatively developed, which is the, cr the cre uh, creative side that we've been discussing so far. So creatively developed, again, successful campaigns are are successful because they reach an, a creative excellence in their presentation to their market. So creatively developed. The fourth one is the O stands for organized in propagation. Organized in propagation means that successful campaigns have a plan to distribute, distribute their message and to reach their audience. But that plan is never random. It's always in a very organized fashion. And then the last uh, letter, last quality, uh, of, of our bacon formula is numerically measured. Numerically measured means that we, we are going to determine success or failure not based on subjective uh, ideas but rather based on numbers. Did we hit those numbers that we define back in the strategic, in the strategy phase, did we hit our numbers, did we fall short or did we exceed them and one way or another whether we failed or we, su we succeeded we're going to use those numbers to optimize and to refine our approach in order to uh, achieve a greater level of success. So that's the digital bacon formula and that's what my book is about not only defining these five qualities but also defining a process to achieve these qualities for your digital campaign. Excellent. And uh, it's, um, I was, uh, I noticed that it's also on Amazon so you can also go yes. there. And you Absolutely. can find it there. You can just Google it, find an Amazon digital <laughs> bacon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Fausto. No, I was going to ask him, just as a yogi, if you're going to add a discount for the Dojo viewers at the moment. Dojo viewers <laughs> get a discount. <laughs> well, no. be because I'm selling it on Amazon, I don't control the price for it. Don't worry about it. Um, if I ever make it out to your facilities, I always sell it at a discount when I'm in person. So That will be awesome. So, guys, l l let's... Let's bring him over. Let's yeah. see, let's take Alex to Cancun then. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, that would be a good idea. By the way, we have had a. Uh, this is so that you know, um, Alex. We have had speakers here in Dojo Live who are also authors, and uh, with uh, in in different areas that are somehow related to what you're doing, creative thinking, creative strategy, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, some of them have even. Um, of uh, flown over to Mexico City, and they have, we have met. So it was kind of cool. We have there's a gentleman, uh, one of our speakers. It's right there on the previous episodes part, and it's called. Uh, he's uh, his name is Kevin Dom, and Matt uh, Matt Perez, the CEO of, of yourself and myself, went to meet with him with lunch. So it was really an experience, and we all we're also going to have another one of our speakers, Monica Tajer. He she lives in Los Angeles and. And she's going to be here in Mexico City, so it's it's always good to be in touch to uh, 
to get this thing rolling and to create, generate more momentum. Absolutely. So, especially now you, uh, like Alex, that have a, 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 there's a Spanish version of your book. Absolutely. You can easily, well, you're doing it now. You're touting it to our audience right now, So, and, and it'll keep doing so for a long time. Yep. So, okay, with that being said, uh, let me just move on to the final request for questions. I don't know. No one, uh, there, there's really no, no questions from the audience like <laughs> right now. But I'm sure there will be, so they, if we don't get them now, we're going to get them at some point in time, and I'll just send them over to you. That, like tends said, to be a, that tends to be a natural reaction when I talk about this. It's like, whoa, I've never really thought about this, so let me just... <laughs> and then people just kind of incorporate it. So mm -hmm. I do welcome you know, thoughts after the show. Just reach out to me via Twitter. I'm at ALXRO. You, you want to write it down on a little piece of paper and show it to the camera? Good idea. So let's write it down. Yeah, let's let's use uh, the oldest piece of technology that uh, has been around for ages is like paper. So let's just doesn't it's fail proof. So we we didn't we didn't use post-its here. So let me show you here. Just a bit. <laughs> so, oh yeah, yeah. A L X R O D Z. I don't know if it's does it show flipped or no. No, 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 no. It's perfect. Okay, good. So A L X not not with an E. A L X R O D Z. Just reach out to me if you like this conversation, and uh, and yeah, I'd love to hear your questions, your thoughts. <laughs> Sorry, Alex, but I have some friends uh, asking on Twitter that if you a rod the ball yeah, it's, player, <laughs> it's funny. I get that all the time. And and the thing is, the thing is that a rod, he's also Dominican. He's uh -huh. also from New York. Also millionaire. Like, yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it 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 feels it it. it it gives people the wrong impression that it's just a gimmick that I built, but it, I, I I have a birth certificate that states that this is my actual name. This is the true A rat, okay, the real one. <laughs> well, maybe I have to do some research here, and you have to excuse my ignorance. Who's A, a rod? You're, you're, uh, you're gonna I'm come not a, your I'm side not a sports fan, friends. so probably I don't, I wouldn't know. So. It, Actually, I'm not a sports fan either. I, I, so uh, it's it couldn't be more obtuse. But from who's what I Aaron? Said. Who's Aaron? Alex Rodriguez. He's he's a, uh, a baseball player in the New York Yankees. Pretty ooh, famous. Ooh, I think he's the most highly paid. I don't know about MLB, <laughs> but he's one of the most highly paid. Hey, I, I I hear you. I hear you, Alex. I get all the time. Every time I introduce myself <laughs> as right. Carlos Carlos Ponce, and I go, and, and they go. Usually, ladies, they go like, "Who like? Oh, the singer? No, I'm not." Yes. The singer. And once they look at me, they go, "Yeah, you're not him." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you, we, we're part of a fraternity of people that uh, that we are called by by our namesake and a computer. Yeah. I'm yet to find someone named Fausto Guerrero, but uh, I'm sure he's out there. <laughs> there's 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 already seven in Hermosillo, and they have confused me with them. So with who? None of there's another Fausto Guerrero here, and I have friends who have confused them. And left them kinky notes. I mean, oh my with goodness. Me, and then yeah. they realized it wasn't me. I mean, they have been in trouble. However, they are not that rich or important or famous, so I'm saved. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we are approaching the final segment. We're final minutes of this conversation. And, um, well, as you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, before we, we went live, um, Alex, well, first of all, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for having agreed to be here with us today, and I think it was a great talk. We're, we're going to be in touch, definitely. Please. And also, yes, and uh, um, maybe after the conversation or whenever it suits you, send me your postal address. We're sending you this as a token of appreciation as thank well so as the uh, this uh, little USB kind of, uh, drive, which Very is kind of cool. Uh, and again, uh, I think that's pretty much it. We're about to close it for today, and I think that uh, I'm sure that a lot of folks out there who are either watching or will be watching uh, at some point um, in our on our page, which is dojo.nearsoft.com. Again, dojo.nearsoft.com. And that's where you can find the previous episodes, in, including this one, which is about to come to an end. And Fausto, I want to thank you also for being co-host. You're great, as usual, and uh, I think that we couldn't have done this uh, as good uh, without you. So thank you. Thank you, the three, uh, the, the two of you, 
and I look forward to having you again sometime in the future. Is there anything else you would like to leave our viewers with, uh, Alex, before we go? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to be confusing or overwhelming with invitations because we we do put out a lot of content out there. But uh, if I would would it just invite people to three places, which I know is a lot, but I think there are there are different types of value that we put out there, and I think people can take advantage of. Number one is again my book site, which is digitalbaconbook.com. And from there, you can go from the from the Spanish version from there, digitalbaconbook.com, and then you can find way where you can purchase the book. That's one. Number two is our content site, which is actually creativestrategytips.com. And creativestrategytips.com is a co collection of articles that we publish all about either creative or strategic uh, ends of, of our mindset. So there's, there's certainly things that can challenge you wherever you're coming from, uh, whether creative or strategic end. And then finally, the last one is invite your viewers to my podcast, which is digitalmarketingminute.net. Digitalmarketingminute.net is a daily one minute, and that means literally 60 second episode podcast uh, awesome. in, which, in which we talk about uh, digital marketing and tactics and strategies and things like that. Uh, the subtitle for Digital Marketing Minute is Digital Marketing Minute Creative Strategy Tips for Busy People. I've designed this for busy people that are, you know, be, people that are busy that don't have the, all the time to consume all the good content that is out there, but want to. Uh, this is a way to just get it in daily 60-second bites. Awesome, excellent, definitely great. And uh, well, as you can see, I use my my um, analog prompter, which is a note, a post-it notepad. <laughs> it's right there, digital. DigitalBaconBook.com and then CreativeStrategyTips.com and DigitalMarketMarketingMinute.net. Yeah. So there you have it, folks. Well, I guess we're we're uh, we're done for the day. Alex, thank you so much. You've been great. Uh, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you and your audience. Thank you for having me on. And like I said, my goal here has been to add value to you, and I hope I've done that. Please feel uh, free to reach out to me if there's anything, any thoughts that you want to throw my way or any way I can help you. Um, I'll just leave this with this thought. My name is my authentic name, Alex. It's actually <laughs> Alexander. Alexander literally means, from the Greek, it means helper of people. And this is my life mission. So if there's anybody in your audience that I can lift up or help in some way, please feel free to reach out. You're going to make me feel more alive by doing that. Ooh, Thank you so much, Alex. We'll certainly make sure that we can do that. And actually, I like your mission statement. It's right there and on your profile. It says just three words, right? Here to help. Here to help. That's what we <laughs> doesn't do. doesn't get any more clear than that. All right. Well, thank you again, Alex. Uh, folks, well, it was a, it's been a great session. So thank you, Fausto. Thank you, Alex. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much, guys. Take a pleasure, care. Alex. I will throw some kisses like... <laughs> <laughs> like the co-host here. <laughs> Alrighty, bye-bye, guys. Bye.